question is, what's the role of mechanical engineering in actually doing what needs doing now? And the answer has to be everything. Because you can't change what we've done without us. We have to do it. And so looking at that field, what is involved in it? What, what would we do? Um, basically, my group discovered a new engineering um, discipline called transition engineering. The work, the methodology of achieving what needs to be done, and that is reducing um, fossil fuel use by a lot, fast. Right? So if you're aware of the IPCC, um, those are the representative carbon pathways, um, and the purple one on the bottom is the one we're meant to be on in order to gift to our grandchildren a survivable planet. All right, so tonight I'm going to talk about um, the pressures that are building for change. We have the climate emergency response. What is the next right step? What is the next right step for Wanganui Council? What is the next right step for Christchurch Council? What is the next right step for Fonterra? Right. And then I'm going to give you an example um, from a transition engineering project we did locally. And that will hopefully convince you that this field of transition engineering is like, um, like other fields of engineering. It emerges through the profession, recognizing that we have fundamentals and we have methodologies that we use that achieve the things that we need to get done, right? So that's our job as engineers, get stuff done. So first, let's talk about this pressure building. Now, the, um, I am going to assume you all understand the problem of climate change. Uh, too much fossil carbon from 150 million years ago is coming into our time where we have glaciers and ice at the poles and they didn't. Uh, so 150 million years ago, life was booming so fast that bacteria and, and, and funguses, and it, they couldn't keep up with it. And so it accumulated in the strata, in the, in the ocean layers, in swamps. And so this pressure is coming because of what we are doing. So in the late 50s, an observatory for carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere was built on Mauna Loa Volcano in, in Hawaii. And it was built in the late 50s because of the concern that the CO2 level in the atmosphere was climbing quite high, and that could change the thermodynamics of the planet so that the planet warmed, and that would then change things. And nobody could really think of that that could be a good thing. <laughs> so the, the observatory was built, and then sure enough, the fossil carbon coming out of the ground is added to the atmosphere via mechanical engineering. All right. And that continued for quite some time. And um, the science models got better, and international cooperation got better, and we had the Kyoto um, Protocol. And the science showed that 350 parts per million, this, this place here, was kind of a safety limit. If we went above 350 parts per million accumulation of CO2 in the atmosphere, things were going to change, and, and there was going to be rock and rolling. That the extremes that we thought we knew were going to be blown out, either side. <coughs> too cold, too hot, too dry. Yeah. All right, so um, the countries of the world agreed to reduce their emissions, um, but even reducing emissions is still emitting. And so up goes at about 2 to 3% a year growth in the atmospheric CO2 concentration. Um, then the world got together in 2015, and at the Paris summit, they said, look, okay, we have to get back down below the, below the safety limit. We've got to get back down there. Um, and if we happen to go above that one, um, then that's actually a failure limit. Things are going to be quite bad. Probably lose 50% of the species on the planet. We'll lose the ice caps. The, the, the sea level will rise. We'll lose a lot of property. Okay, so a failure limit. In engineering terms, a failure limit means very specific things. Don't do that. Not a target. Not a target. <laughs> what that means then um, is what? That that graph is going to look different in the future. It's going to stop growing. And do you know what that means? 
how does an accumulation stop growing? You stop adding to it. Right? How are we going to stop adding to it? How about more renewables? Have you heard that? Is that a strategy? Is that a thing we're going to try to do? More renewables. All right, well, I've given you the data here um, from the 90s of the oil production every year. So that's, that's an amount every year in millions of tons of oil equivalent of <coughs> oil, gas, nuclear, hydro, coal, and a little orange sliver. Okay, What's the little orange sliver? All other renewables combined. Geothermal, biomass, biofuels, solar, wind. Yes, they have been growing. Look at that growth. <laughs> All right. Not as fast as oil grows or gas. Okay. So the story we're telling ourselves that the growth of 51 million barrels of oil equivalent in 2016 was a great thing. It was, okay, that's fine. It, it didn't grow out, grow oil. oil. Um, now, the coal went down, that's cool. Um, but the next year, it didn't. <laughs> All right, so the race, if you picture this as a race, um, renewables aren't gonna win it. There's no <coughs> way that renewables replace fossil fuels. That, that isn't the way it's going to happen. Okay, so what, what other things have you heard of? How about the announcement we just had of the strategy for climate, and I think it had electric vehicles, and then electric vehicles, and more electric vehicles, and electric vehicles. Yeah, pretty sure that was it. So let's look at that. Electric vehicles to the rescue. So here's a, a the government um, policy. 16% um, annual growth in the number of electric vehicles. 16% is a massive growth rate. That would be something. Um, so with that 16% growth and the business as usual growth of cars, so that's, that's what we've been doing, we keep doing it, we see the, the EVs just take off because you know they're about 1% or something. Um, and there go the, they, uh, the portion that's um, internal combustion engines is dropping off by 2050. So we achieve the government plan, and what we see on the other side over there, the orange one is the business as usual cumulative emissions. You remember the Mauna Loa? <laughs> and the blue one is that scenario. Doesn't look like that sort of breaky, going flat thing. It doesn't look like it at all. So remember, that's what we actually have to do. That's our climate emergency. So no, the EV policy of New Zealand does not accomplish that for, for New Zealand or for anybody else. It's the same story for everybody else. Um, what's wrong with this picture? This one. Continued growth of any kind of vehicle that wraps 3,000 kilograms of metals and plastics and rubbers around you so you can move. That's the problem. Growth of that is throwing CO2 into the air because of the extraction of those materials, the manufacturing of those materials, and then, of course, the operating of, of that vehicle. All right, um, what about um, hydrogen? Does anybody here, have you heard of hydrogen that we're gonna, it's a big government policy. Our government spent quite a bit of money on it so far. Um, do you want me to tell you about hydrogen? I can skip this. Oh, yes. all right. <laughs> <clears throat> the way I'm going to explain it to you is let's say that we built a 100 megawatt wind farm. This is um, not quite as big as West Wind Wind Farm, but most of the power from that would be excess. So the story is that we're going to use excess wind and solar to generate hydrogen to run our economy. Yeah, so the renewable green hydrogen. So we know we can afford a 100 megawatt wind farm. We have several of them. Yeah? All right, so that's not a problem. Now, from that wind farm, we're going to take 7 megawatts and use it to compress the hydrogen we made, and we're going to take 93 megawatts and use it to make the hydrogen. Now, if we run that for an hour, then we'll have megawatt hours. Okay, so that's running our, our plan here for an hour. Um, there's a lot of stuff that goes into um, producing hydrogen, but what we get over there is 2,000 kilograms of hydrogen from our 100 megawatt power plant. So 2,000 kilograms seems like quite a bit. Hmm? Um, all right, now I take that 2,000 kilograms of hydrogen and I put it through a fuel cell to make electricity, and I get back 26 megawatt hours of electricity. So I put in 100, I get back 26. <laughs> But we had green hydrogen. Did we feel better? 
<laughs> it's not a good deal, all right? Well, let's look at a little more. How about costs? Um, my, um, my wind farm costs about $1,600 per kilowatt of plant, so per kilowatt of generating capacity. Now, the rest of this kit costs $11,500 per kilowatt. So I get three quarters less electricity for twice the price. You like it? Oh, three times the price. Sorry, you still got to pay for wind turbines. <laughs> okay, but it'd be cool. We could use our wind to generate a whole lot per year, a whole lot of um, gigawatt hours per year, and put it into cars. How many cars? Well, each car uses that much hy um, hydrogen per year. We know what car there is, Toyota Mirai. Um, that's the car that gets, you know, apparently you can get one for that little price. Um, so far, Toyota has manufactured about 6,000 of those vehicles. Um, but this much hydrogen from our wind farm could fuel um, 34,000 cars, which is about 1% of the New Zealand fleet in 2019. And that would cost only about $2.8 billion to do that. So 38,000, 34,000, who's the lucky ones? The rest of us are going to spend $2.8 billion so you can drive a hydrogen car. I think, are we, are we about done with the hydrogen yet? Oh, no, no, wait, wait, there's more. Um, every hydrogen car requires 30 to 60 grams of platinum. If New Zealand can convince the rest of the world to use all of the platinum that's not used in catalytic converters, um, because the rest of the world doesn't want to have ground level air pollution from cars like we do, um, then we could get four million cars. So all the platinum production in the world, about 120 tons of it, that doesn't go into catalytic converters, so all the stuff that goes into electronics and jewelry and all sorts of other things, if we could convince the rest of the world to give us that, we could have four million cars. Now, just for a point, there's 1.4 billion cars on the planet. So there isn't enough platinum to make enough hydrogen cars, or trucks. Trucks use platinum too. Trucks use that same fuel cell. The truck is a nonsense, the boat is a nonsense, the plane is a nonsense, the car is a nonsense. You do not use hydrogen for fuel, and you don't actually hold on to it for very long either because it will eat the container it's in. This has been known for yonks, that hydrogen embrittles metals. It, it, it eats away at them and the, a, an extremely explosive material that's eating away at its own container just isn't the best plan you ever had. Other little things like you can't put an odorant in it. You know how natural gas, you can put something in it that smells like hydrogen sulfide so you know that natural gas is getting out? You, you can't float another gas in hydrogen because it's too light. So we can't, we can't have basic safety with hydrogen. So, done with hydrogen? Yes. <laughs> All right, so how about offsets? That's the next one. What happened there? How about offsets? All right. What the idea of offsets is, is that biological um, processes could take carbon dioxide out of the air at the same rate that we're putting it in. That would be great. Can you guys see those numbers? There's orders of magnitude missing there. So let's, let's put it this way. We want green tourism. So a, uh, a person from Los Angeles gets on a flight, they come here, and that means that, that they don't have to quarantine anymore because we don't have COVID, but they do have to spend two weeks planting 500 trees. <laughs> <laughs> so they really want to offset, we're up for it. High five. Five trees. Right? <laughs> we are up for it. Yeah, so the problem is that the trees um, really don't suck up hydrogen at the same rate at which we produce it. I got a better one. So our Los Angeles tourists come here and they kill two cows. <laughs> Another way to offset the carbon that would have otherwise been emitted. All right, yeah, the offsetting problem is big also because that tree that we supposedly plant didn't go in a place where we cut down a tree before. So it's actually just putting back the carbon sink that was there before. It's not offsetting fossil carbon. Right? 
So absolutely, let's make every tourist pay to plant 500 trees, but let's not kid ourselves as offsetting the carbon that they put in the air to get here. So what is it really that's causing the pressure that we're feeling about climate change? It's because we do not have an answer we like. <laughs> Let that sink in. The answer is clear, the answer is obvious, the answer is scientific, the answer is not in question. The answer is reducing the fossil fuel production. So here are the graphs from the scientists from the IPCC that show us what the chance of staying below 1.5 degrees warming, that's a smidge below the failure limit, um, is given a decline rate of fossil fuel production. So the 2% chance the red one, of staying below 1.5 this century can be achieved by a 3% production decline. Okay? Um, what the IPCC, the, the, the Paris Agreement said, the COP21 Paris Agreement said, we want at least a 50 chance, 50-50 chance. You know, there's all this negotiating going on, a 50-50 chance that the planet is not really a mess by the end of the century um, and to do that, we have to have a 10% decline per year. And to do that, we reckon it'd be a carbon price of about $250 um, dollars US per ton of CO2. Right? We have debated, maybe we ought to have a carbon price for quite a few years. Do you think right now the international price is somewhere around $37 a ton? Do you think we're going to do that? All right. The New Zealand Climate Change Commission recommendation in their draft report is the top one. What, which one of those chances, which one do you think those guys want? I think I know. Which one do you want to gift them? And then we're going to Think for a minute about what that would mean. 10% production per year to 20% production re retreat per year. Um, what that really means is leaving enough fossil fuel in the ground that those great grandkids actually have some. This is the most important fuel ever found. It is the most important mineral ever found. And we waste it, we blow it away. Saving some for later is one of those things you learn when you're a toddler, <laughs> you know? Don't just gobble it all up now. Save some for later. Save some for dad when he gets home, yeah? Save some for somebody else. So even if you can't picture that you would want to give up some conveniences or some whatever it was you were doing, <laughs> then, yeah, I, okay, look, I get it. We actually are not equipped to think about people in the future studied this a lot. Because why? We're empathetic. We understand that people that we know now will be alive 100 years from now. They will know whether we did it or not. Right? We know that we have connections to our fauna that, that move through time in at least 100 years where we personally know people within that 100 year time span. So why can we not do things for the benefit of future people? Well, because future people can't sue us. Future people have no legal standing in any of our legal codes. Future people have no consumer power. Future people don't exist to us. How did we get this way? We're humans. We're empathetic. We understand family. How did we get this way? And I think it's because tradition works. When you have ways that work, you ensconce them in your tradition and in your culture, and you are gifting that to the future generations, something that works. That is why we keep culture, and we keep tradition, and we teach it to our kids, and we teach it to our grandkids, because it's what works. And you're going to be OK if you follow those traditions. All right. Maybe that's what we lost. Our tradition now is what? What do we believe in? People who believe in something, who have culture and tradition, it shapes their lives. What shapes our lives? Capitalist consumerism. Okay, 
now I see the problem. <laughs> How are we going to do something about this? Well, in the rest of my talk, uh, or to the second part, I just want to tell you about a project we did. And I think you'll see that transition engineering lets us take on these impossible problems and possibly grow new traditions. All right, transition engineering. Think of it like <clears throat> safety. Right? People don't have to do things that keep you safe, but they do. Who does? Engineers. Why? They probably don't even know. It's their tradition. <laughs> it's our ethos. It's what we do. Right? That's what tradition means. You just do it because it's right. right? It wasn't right 100 years ago. It was OK in the United States to have 39 coal miners dying per day. It was the price of progress. It was what industry required. If you didn't want the job, you didn't have to take it. Sad, but uh, right? it was OK. Today, it is not OK for one person to die in a coal mine. Our culture has indeed shifted when it comes to safety. So we're going to use that, and we're going to use the idea of safety as the way to transition. What did safety mean 100 years ago when that change started, not killing people at work, not killing people from the manufactured foods they were eating, from the um, steamships they were riding in? What did it mean? It meant changing what you were doing that was already working, that was already successful. Can we do that? Absolutely we can do it. That's what we're going to do. All right, transition engineering is a field. It's a field now because in 2019, a textbook was published that all engineers can read and understand the same way they can read safety training and understand what to do. Fire safety training, yeah. quake safety training. And this book is written in a way that everybody can read it, not just the engineers, because safety is a miraculous thing. There's, in the United States right now, 24,000 safety engineers for the entire United States. Would you say that, this, that the United States actually uh, you know, attends to safety in workplaces and public places? They do. How do they do it with only 24,000 people? Well, because of the participation of all the other people. So safety is participatory sport. And so is transition, because we're all going there together. All right. Um, we have a company that works with um, other companies to do the training and to help them uh, make sense of the transition and what they're, what they're going to do that's different. We have a, um, a course for management level people all across our economy. Um, now at the University of Canterbury, it started last month. And we have a course, think of it as safety training for the climate emergency, training for the first responders, the engineers. In two years, this is an online um, self-guided course in six modules, takes a few weeks. If all engineers in New Zealand had transition training, climate emergency first responder training, the future could not possibly be the same as it's going to be if they don't. All right? Because if every engineer in New Zealand is thinking about, okay, how would we be changing this, the thing they know about, the thing that they can change? then the future is a different place, just like it was with safety engineering. So here's the project that we did in, I believe it was, right after the quakes, everything in Christchurch is pre-quake, after quake. Um, so in 2011, the, um, the mayor of Ruapehu district asked me to come to Ruapehu and to help them. They had intractable problems. What intractable problem? Um, housing? You live in a lovely place that Aucklanders come to on the weekend, and they go, oh, I want a piece of this. So they buy a house, and now you don't have it anymore. Right? <laughs> they build a house, but not for you. Yeah, they might rent it to you for a few months in the summer, but not in the winter, because they want to go there. The people from Auckland flock to their holiday homes in Ohakune and drive the power demand from the maximum that was ever designed for the grid, the network in Ohakune of two megawatts to 12 megawatts. And that means that the Ohakune consumers, all 2,200 of them are now hit with a $2.5 million penalty. 
because the Aucklanders came. Why did they use so much power? Because they came in the winter to go skiing, to play in the snow, and the house that they um, have there is freezing cold, and so they turn on all the heaters and the hot water, and it goes from there. All right, so there's a problem. The problem is that 40% of the Tamariki end up in the hospital here in Fanganui every winter with respiratory distress because their houses are not healthy for them. Why? Because they're cold and they're damp. They're uninsulated. They're old workers' huts that weren't really meant to be housing, and yet still, here they are. All right, so that's our problem. We've got great things like skiing. We've got intermittent um, uh, employment, very much underemployment. You can pick carrots for a few months, and you can work in a ski field for a few months. What else are you going to do in Oakland and Rati? All right. Um, we've got a large number of unoccupied holiday homes. People get kicked out of their rentals over the winter, and the health is a massive problem. So that's what I was talking about. All right, this is what we call a wicked problem. That are you going to tell the Aucklanders not to come? Are you going to write something that says they have to sell their houses? Do you think the local people can afford those houses? They used to be able to afford houses there. No, they can't because the Aucklanders came. All right, so are you going to tell the Aucklanders not to come? Is that your problem? This is what's wicked. <laughs> what wicked means is that the thing that works and that you've come to depend on is the problem you have. <laughs> no solution. All right. So um, we've got, in, there's lots of problems there, but the symptoms are the children with serious illnesses every year, all of the time lost from work of their parents because the kids are so sick, they have to lose work time off work. 25% of residents can't afford to pay their rates. Yeah, it's a, it's a tough place. Um, they're living in these old workers' cottages. All right, so this is how we handle a wicked problem. We admit that tension between what we're doing because it works and what we don't, what our problem is, is that same thing. So what works is Aucklanders coming for ski holidays because what other economy were you going to have in Auckland? <laughs> so that's what's working now. And the people are able to afford the nearly falling down old workers' cottages that are there, um, which they, again, often get kicked out of. So that's sort of what's working. But what's not working is that those houses are not sustainable. The, ha the health costs aren't sustainable. And um, the burden of the Aucklanders is not sustainable. So they, they bring a positive, but they also bring a burden. People are coping the best they can, the way they always do. They're satisfying their needs for shelter and for warmth the best they can. They're burning wood. They're um, you know, wrapping up in, in blankets. Um, but it causes harm. This is not healthy to have a society like this, to have this kind of social harm. Um, people need healthy and affordable shelter. Therefore, something has to change. But the people cannot possibly afford to build new houses or retrofit those houses. They, they don't even have money for basics. So what in the world is going to happen? And we applied the transition engineering methodology, and we came up with a solution, or a project. We, call it, we don't call them solutions, because that kind of problem don't have solution. But the sure next step, the next step that takes you in a direction where your people are healthy, your economy is good, you're milking the Aucklanders for all they're worth, and, <laughs> and they're not causing that problem for you anymore. Fair enough? All right. So what the project is, is Te Whare Ahuru, and that is a warm, healthy, affordable, sustainable housing solution. Um, it has to use local resources. It has to generate jobs. It has to have building standards that are better than what the standard is now. And it has to have climate appropriate construction, community groupings of houses, culture and agriculture, and that looks like this. Rupehu District has a lot of pine forest. A 400 millimeter pine log has higher R value, insulation value, than the current New Zealand standard for the Rupehu District. Okay? How many pine logs that big are there in the Rupehu district that are not economical to cut down and move to the pulp mill because the pulp mill will only give you 10 bucks for it? But with 65 of these logs, you could have a house 
that's warm, that has no mildew, and that will last for hundreds of years. Hmm. Our project was to work with the Natirangi on what that house would look like. What would it be like? What are your needs? How would this work? And then for us to do the research on working with the council on how to understand this house, working with an architect to develop an archetypal Modi house. And we don't want American houses. We don't want German houses. We want Modi houses. And this area around the mountain becomes one of those iconic, architecturally, culturally rich areas because of the way the houses are built. All right, so we've got um, suitability, affordability. These are all the things we're going to work through and see if we can make it work. Um, log homes require much less materials and especially much less man-made materials. In fact, you walk through the forest and you look for something that has about a 12 meter run. That's the maximum you need, eight meters you can build a house with. But I want 12 meter run. I clop the top off. I don't want a left hand twist, I want a right hand twist. I want it pretty straight and I don't want too much, uh, there's a certain amount of variation in the trunk size. Um, that's about one in 15 logs, one in 15 trees is like that. So I go in and I pop its top off and then strip off a meter of bark around the bottom every year. So you go into the forest, strip off a meter of bark, go up another meter, go up another meter, and yeah, you're killing the tree slowly, and it is sapping as hard as it can, and by the time you cut it down, five years later, it has preserved itself. You heard of amber? It has pumped so much sap into itself, trying to stay alive, that it has given you a permanent house that will last for hundreds of years. Okay? All of that, instead of importing all those materials from Australia, having to buy them from Fletcher's, you as a people can husband, harvest, and build your own homes. Now, have any of you ever actually been in a log home? Are they comfortable? Warm. Warm. Humidity level moderated. No mildew. Yeah? And extra special bonus, quake proof. <laughs> because they just rock and roll and go back where they were. All right, very hard to knock them down. A little bit of proof in the pudding for you of this longevity because that's what we meant by sustainability in the first place. So you, you hopefully will put the house where you want it in the way you want it. Here's the Korean expression. Um, I visited these homes, they're 700 years old and they're still achingly beautiful. They're still lived in, they're still treasured. Notice a feature that is required for this to occur. Yep. Eaves. <laughs> you have to keep the water off the wood. All right. Um, how about six, the four to six hundred year old wood structures in Germany? They know how to do it. Um, what about the French Alps? That's a pretty harsh environment, the French Alps. These uh, huts that my husband and I visited, oh, they're summer houses up in the Alps. They were built in the 1720s, solid logs, still there. People still live in them. Uh, what about America? This is the oldest house, uh, log house built in America, um, 1639, still being lived in. Um, and we've got over here the Norwegians. If there's anybody who knows log houses, it's the freaking Norwegians. Look at that, five, <laughs> 957 AD, that house is built. And it is seeping with culture. It is seeping with who we are and what we're doing here. All right, and of course the, the church in Norway as well. Um, how do they do it? With a, with a hatchet <laughs> and a little bit of know-how, right? So they do that tree preservation trick. Um, they love pine, they love Douglas fir. Doesn't really matter what kind of tree. Um, the Tehari Ahuru design that we worked out with um, the people of Natirangi um, went on about a four day visit where we just talked to a lot of people. They all had the same vision of the same house in their head. And they kept talking about the angle of the roof and it was the Mount Rapehu <coughs> angle. And we checked that out. All of the log home traditions around the world, there isn't any that has that angle. This is a quintessentially New Zealand design. What else is quintessentially New Zealand about it is the open space 
where the Tomariki run and the, the Fanau get together. The big porch where people can hang out together. That's very Pacific to have the, the outside space where people can come and visit and not have to go inside. And even more characteristically, the entrance to the house when you return to your house after being out is on the side and there's a wash basin there. So there you go. Um, they also have a loft. So there's a loft where extra people can um, stay and the heating um, that's required is done by a wood fire that is also the cook stove and the water heater. So those already exist, nothing new and exciting there, no hydrogen needed. We did two sizes, one for a family that had three bedrooms, uh, well two bedrooms and the, the loft um, could be made into two bedrooms as well. This one's the granny flat and the, the aunties love this one because they, they want their little cottage and it's an open plan so you got the kitchen and lounge, that's the front porch out that way, which by the way has to face the mountain. All right. Here's the side entrance with the wash basin so you can come in, wash your hands. That's important. When you come in, you have to wash your hands. Clean yourself up. Have the stairs upstairs. Um, the bathroom, we put it in here because architecturally you would, but they want it out there. The, the toilet and the washing is not in the house. It's out of the house. And that's perfectly fine because the eaves are so big, it will just be a little lean-to over here on the side. Okay. So you have a little porch area here where you can go in and out to the bathroom and then the bedroom and then you get, you get more space indoors. So that's the design, the architect has actually designed that, it can now be built. Um, it's a cultural expression, it is a connection with the land and the trees that are there on the land. Currently they're running to the pulp mill, we visited the pulp mill and they said, well actually if you, would, if you come in here and tag those trees, do that thing, we'll just set those aside when we harvest would make any difference to us. The number of logs you would need to rebuild um, Ohakune and Ratahi and the rural regions um, for every house that needs to be rebuilt, they wouldn't even notice it. All right. So that resource, just going out the door to make toilet paper, why are we doing that? All right, social benefits. This is the team of final year engineers and myself um, working with um, some of the people there um, locally. Like we said, we listened very hard. You can see um, Timo listening very hard there. Um, we went out and um, watched people, you know, people there know how to, how to work in the woods. And then a bunch of students built um, a log house. So there's our design. There's what the logs look like. They're quite beautiful. They're put together into a house and there it is. It is modest. It's not a mansion. It's affordable. It's warm. It's dry for the next 500 years, okay? So this project we would very much like to see done. That's why we did the engineering, to prove to whoever the certifier is, we want a, a um, New Zealand-wide certification of Te Whare Ahuru, that design already done, ready to go. This is how you build it. This interesting notch design there seals against air, and the more the um, the, the logs settle, there's, there's um, hurricane bolts that, that force the logs as they age and settle to pull together even more tightly. There's insulation in that notch and it, it seals up, so they're, they're not drafty. Um, we modeled the, uh, the heat transfer through there to show that radiata pine again meets the New Zealand standard at the moment if you have 400 millimeters. Uh, get bigger logs, it's even better. Here's why it's also healthy. The blue line is the, the thermal response of the logs, the log home. The other swingy one is what your normal house that's uninsulated does. So what is killing you is this huge drop. Okay, during the day, the sun comes streaming through the windows, everybody's happy, and then that temperature just plummets the minute the sun starts to set. Am I right? Mm -hmm. Down it goes. Condensation. Not just where you can see it, but in your walls, on the back side of your window frames, everywhere. It's, it's there everywhere <coughs> because it's so cold. It was warm. The, the air in the house is laden with moisture. You drop that temperature and you just drive all that insulation into your walls because that's the coldest surface. And the, the um, moisture will 
condense on the coldest surfaces it can find, and that's in your walls. All right, so that's why our homes are patently unhealthy, plus that they get really cold. So the long home is simply comfortable and also moisture controlled. Um, we know how to make it airtight, um, and that is uh, actually the science was done um, in California, that this is the best cut, and that's what can be taught. Um, it absolutely moisture control as long as you keep the rain off, so you need a nice big roof. And the cost to build a 100 square meter house with a loft, so 100 square meter footprint, but then you get the extra lost loft, is 36 logs plus the roof beams. Um, there are some materials, some uh, metal. Um, you got to peel the logs. You don't have to actually peel the logs. You can mechanically <coughs> peel the logs, but these guys were doing it by hand. Um, you have to assemble them, build a foundation, put on a roof, put in windows and doors, and you are ready for living in it for fit out, so you still have to put in um, your cook stove and your kitchen, but at $75,000. And every bit of that money was spent in your community. What do you have for the floor? Uh, the floors are just a uh, regular floor that you would build anywhere, so depending on your soils, depending on where you are, depending on, your, on the, you know, what's going on, piles with um, just exactly the same floor you build anywhere. You can do um, concrete slab, you can do piles with insulation underneath, um, doesn't matter. Okay, so same old floor. Or are you saying the cost of the floor? Now that's the foundation. That included the floor. So just floorboards or plank boards or whatever you like. So going forward, we want to, um, oh, we did have Natirangi leaders come and visit the home. They liked it, loved it very much. The architecture is complete, the log shell is prepared. Um, some few questions we have left are the ra uh, radiate of pine durability, the processes by which you ensure the durability. You don't want it to rot out from underneath you. The stewardship of the wood and of the homes and translating and understanding the log home standards so that the council can sign off on them at minimum cost. So we worked with the council of the Rupeo district and they were 100% on board with that. We want to get our understanding so high that the cost of consent can go down to $2,000. The last log home built in, in uh, Ohakune, the consent was something like $45,000. Because the council doesn't understand it. They don't know if it's meeting standards or not. So University of Canterbury, um, we can work with the New Zealand Log Home Association, uh, Association of Log Home Builders, to construct this standard that councils can understand for this modest little house. All right, so in conclusion, um, transition to the low carbon future in time as possible. Do you know what happens if rural New Zealand and the towns of New Zealand take every home that has the paint peeling because the wood is rotting, it's not going to be there very much longer, it just really can't. Take those away gently and respectfully and put log homes there. <laughs> Everywhere where there's an uninsulated, unhealthy log, a home is replaced with a New Zealand log home, what would happen to how much gas we use to generate electricity? It could go away because that's why we need the gas, is because our homes are cold and damp and awful in the winter. <coughs> and we try to get a little bit of comfort in there. All right? And especially if you use the wood, wood cooking, then, then that, would, that would for sure do it. All right, so um, I expect Rupay and Wangadu and Councils and the Nati Rangi to contact Transition HQ, get started now on finalizing the steps of this project <laughs> so that it begins now. Because think about it, the, um, the business that, is, that has to build up in order to husband the forest, in order to build the homes, in order to come up with a way to finance those homes. Um, I don't know if I skipped the slide or not, but we also did a study where we looked at how do we make the Aucklanders pay. <laughs> So we need a Callahan grant to be matched by the Iwi's um, um, treaty settlement to build a, uh, the facility to make the log homes, and that's a very well-known facility. We, you know how much tools are in there, it's not that much, you need some cranes, to do a training 
for the people to build the log homes, to connect with the school, to, to be connecting the, the young men in the school with the building so that they can learn geometry and the basic skills they need to build these homes. Um, and then a project to build a very cool Maori village of these Te Whare Okay, the, the, the Ngāti Rangi have a very clear vision of how these houses are laid out, how they're set together facing the mountain with a common building for them. Okay, they've got their idea how they want it to go. So they build a prototype, they build it, and it is a hotel. Right? It's a tourist milking machine. And they <laughs> advertise it, and they start getting revenues from that. And with those revenues, they then start their own financing of their own transitions, now that they have jobs that are paying. And the funnest trick ever is that if you own a holiday home in that area, you cannot just turn up with your cold self. You have to have a care, care, caretaker of your house, and you have to let them know 24 hours ahead of time and you, you can't have, heat your house with electricity or your water, you have to use wood. And you have to let them know to go warm up the house with the wood, get the, get the fire going, okay? So that you don't cause this horrible spike. And then as time goes on and this iconic house is being created in the Ruapehu district, the district starts to set standards for holiday homes. If, you're gonna, if you don't live here and you have a holiday home here, guess what? It has to meet our cultural standard. There are a lot of places in the world that have these cultural standards and the ones that people like to go to. Alright? So, we drive the business toward our people making our kind of house from our resources in our local economy. Alright? So, yeah, we mapped out that economics um, and it would work. So that is about...